at first when radical comes, most rejected. But then there are those with yearning souls who once they meet him, become his one. The radicalness of your faith. Find it. It's not that hard to find I will praise you on the mountains I will praise you when the mountains in my way You're the summit where my feet are I will praise you in the valleys all the same no less God within the shadows No less faithful when the night leads me astray You're the heaven where my heart is In the highlands, in the heartache, all the same oh, oh, oh. Oh, how far beneath your glory Does your kindness extend the path From where your feet rest on the sunrise To where you sweep the sinner's path And oh, how fast would you come running If just a shadow be through the night Trace my steps through all my failures Drop me out the other side For who could dare ascend that mountain That valley hill called Calvary But for the one I call Good Shepherd Who like a lamb was slain I will praise you on the mountains I will praise you when the mountains in my way You're the summit where my feet are I will praise you in the valleys all the same No less God within the shadows No less faithful when the night leads me astray you're the heaven where my heart is In the highlands, in the heart, I call the same Whoa, whoa Whatever I walk through, wherever I am The naked move mountains, wherever I stand if ever I walk through the valley of death, I'll sing through the shadow a song of a sin. Whatever I walk through, wherever I am, your name can move mountains wherever I stand. If ever I walk through the valley 
other day I sing through the shadows My song of a sin My song of a sin Oh, oh, oh yeah. My song of a sin Oh, oh, oh of all valleys come the pastures we call grace a mighty river flowing upward from a deep but empty grave I will praise you on the mountains I will praise you when the mountains in my way You're the summit when my feet are I will praise you in the valleys all the same No less God within the shadows No less faithful when the night leads me astray You're the heaven where my heart in the highlands, in the heartache or the sea. All right. Are you ready to praise the name of the Lord? Come on. Sing. Whoa, whoa, whoa.
Hi, I'm Marvin. And I'm Tracy. And we're the ESPYs. Good morning, everyone. Marvin and I have been having conversations like so many of you about what's been happening in the world, whether it's been the COVID-19 experiences that we've had or the most recent civil unrest. It's all brought about, in my mind, how much God loves each one of us and how he will do anything, including moving heaven and earth, to have us get into a relationship with him. So many different things going on and um, uh, it can be very overwhelming, but we're grateful that um, God, uh, who sent his son, is willing to do anything so that uh, all of us will have a chance to be saved. Psalm 18 says that we cry out to God for help and from his temple, he hears our voice. Our voice goes into his ear. So I hope today that uh, during this service and as we're hearing the singing and the, the songs and the sharing and the word of God, that you'll hear God's voice and know that he hears you and that he'll move heaven and earth to um, have a relationship with you. Welcome to the Charlotte Church. Welcome, everyone. Hello, brothers and sisters. As we continue today with our service I wanted to give a little commentary on the word radical. Just a few moments ago, you saw a slide <clears throat> that talked about radical and those with yearning souls meeting radical and becoming as one with them. And, you know, many times when we think about the word radical, we think of somebody that's way out there, extreme. And from time to time, I like to do the or research the etymology of a word, you know, the, the history of it, where it comes from, how it's changed over over time. And as I looked up the word, I uh, saw that it was from a late Latin word meaning of or having roots. And you could say that someone that's radical has views that are different from the roots up. Starting in the roots where things are really growing and that's where the the magic you know, really happens to sustain growth. And then I looked up words that were synonymous with the word radical. And this is where it got really interesting. There were words like complete, entire, words like absolute, total. And when I looked at that, I thought, huh, okay. And then I thought, this is exactly what Jesus <clears throat> has called all of us too. In Luke chapter 10, they ask him, what's the most important command? What's the biggest one? To love the Lord your God with all, completely. And then he said the second one is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So to love completely, to love God completely, entirely is what Jesus said. In Luke 14, 25 through 33, Jesus gives out these incredible challenges, and then he ends it by saying, in the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. In John 13, when Jesus says, a new command I give you, that new command is loving one another the way that Jesus loves us. It's a much higher standard than just loving each other on our level. Jesus said, if you're gonna love, you're going to love on my level. That's how the world will know that you're my disciples. And that's a whole nother, whole nother thing, right? But then in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul lays out to the Corinthian church what love really is. And he ends that there by saying that love never fails. I thought, wow, with that word, we hear, you know, you need to have a radical faith. You need to have a radical love. And sometimes we can think, okay, wow, you know, it doesn't really take all that. Or, or um, man, I don't know if I can achieve that. Well, with the Holy Spirit, we can, but it's a journey. It's not magic. It's not going to happen at the blink of an eye. This is training ourselves to be godly. This is understanding what the word really calls us to putting ourselves in that position and humbling ourselves to allow the spirit to really work through us. And so we are called to live, love, and act from the roots up. It's not just actions, but in other words, our actions are nurtured from the heart. That's where the roots are. And so we all can be radical, but meaning entirely. 
So if you're all in, you've got your poker chips and you push them all to the center, you're saying, I'm all in. And the more disciples do that, the more radical this church will be. Amen. Good morning, Charlotte Church. First, I'd like to thank everyone for your prayers. Over the time that I've been sick, I am feeling better and I am back to work. So thank you again. This time I'd like to uh, lead us in prayer. Our God and our Father in heaven, you are amazing. You give us your grace, your mercy, even though we don't deserve it. Father, we come to you now because our world is in deep division. We've sinned against you, Father, and we need your healing. I pray, Father, that you would restore this world, heal our land, and heal our souls. Father, thank you so much for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Without his gospel, we would not know you. We would have no idea how to be unified. But through his gospel, we do. Father, we ask you that we can be humble before you, trust in you and your word, and give you all the glory as we pray for this world, pray for healing, for wisdom from our leaders, and also for healing from this virus. Father, we love you and ask you to continue to have mercy on us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You are the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you, our Christ. What a beautiful name.
And now I've got some announcements. And then following this is going to be some really great news. So listen up. I wanted to give you an update on baby Oliver. You know, last week we talked uh, Oliver is the son of Corey and Michael Paulus and the grandson of Keith and Kim Paulus. And um, I wanted to just give you an update. You see the picture there of baby Oliver. Uh, he weighs now just over three pounds and eight ounces. So he is slowly but surely uh, growing and uh, getting, getting better. Uh, his breathing practices are going very well. So I just want to keep praying for Oliver, for baby Oliver. And uh, keep praying for Corey and Michael and also for uh, Kim and Keith as well. Also, I wanted to let you know that um, the staff and, and, and have, have talked and um, we're going to have a series of discussions um, based on the present social, racial, and cultural crisis that we are in today. And the first conversation or discussion uh, Ron and I are going to have and on June 17th, and we're going to record that, and it will be viewed for our midweek service that Wednesday, again on June 17th. And again, it's the beginning of a series of discussions. And we, uh, our whole plan is to use a good cross-section of the church to be involved in uh, these discussions. The first one, again, Ron and I wanted to just have an open, honest uh, discussion about it. I think for you to hear from your two evangelists. And uh, again, that's just a start. But we will have a second one that we're working on for July 8th. That also will be for our midweek service. And we did put in the announcements that July 8th is the new date for that that month for midweek. It was originally slated for July 1st, uh, but some scheduling uh, conflicts. We're moving that first midweek, congregational midweek, again to July 8th, and we'll have a, a group discussion uh, recorded then as well. Um, and But we're keeping the next midweek the same on July 15th. So midweek for July, or two midweeks for July, will be the congregational one, July 8th, and then the family group midweek on July 15th, okay? Um, all right, now some better, better news, right? Uh, a young lady by the name of Lorena Guzman was baptized last Sunday, June 7th. And uh, check out this video and pic, uh, or picture uh, of Lorena. <laughs> The great thing uh, here, you see the sisters, you know, with her and uh, in this picture here. Now you look at the picture to the far right of the picture, you see uh, Bernardo with that big smile on his face. Now to his right, to your left, is Lorena, our new sister in the Lord. Her husband next to her, uh, his name is Ronnie, and her two children, Isabella and Saul. And uh, they're from Venezuela. And Lorena, we look so forward to meeting you. I look forward to meeting you, uh, showering you with love. And I think it's, it's going to be overwhelming when we can all uh, get together. But congratulations uh, in your uh, new life. And uh, we know that God will use you uh, in a great way. So welcome to the family of God. And congratulations for getting your sins forgiven and uh, receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Some more great news. Listen up. Good news from the Charlotte Alpha Omega Campus Ministry. Wani Babalola, a junior at UNCC, 
got baptized on Saturday, June 6th. Congratulations, Wani, and welcome to God's Kingdom. Hi, everybody. We are the, the Bright, Bright family. family. And we just wanted to announce that our youngest, Victoria Bright, just became our newest sister in Christ on Monday, June 8th. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? Do you believe that he died on the cross, rose on the third day for your sins? Yeah. You sure? Yeah. Are you sure? Okay. What's your good confession? Jesus is Lord. Yeah. Jesus is Lord. All right, all right. Let's do it. Want to welcome our newest sister in Christ, Victoria Bright. Woo! Good morning, church. My name is Utrena Benuzwe. This is my lovely wife, Crystal. We lead the youth and family ministry in the Charlotte Church. Today, we would love to honor and recognize all our high school and college graduates. From high school graduating. Caroline Stallings. She'll be attending CPCC and transferring to a four-year university. Diara Mills will be attending Elon in the fall. Donovan R.J. Trexler will be attending CPCC in the criminal justice program. Jada Rhodes will be attending North Carolina A&T. Jalen Giddings will be attending CPCC then transfer to North Carolina Central. Julia Butts will be attending Queens University, majoring in biology. Caitlin Knight will be attending Gaston College to become a veterinary lab technician. Morgan Butts will be attending Vanderbilt University, majoring in biomedical engineering. Naya Jackson will be attending UNC Greensboro majoring in film, media studies, and minoring in drama. William Mimi will be attending UNC Pembroke, studying nursing. William Smith will be attending Cardiff Metropolitan University in Wales in the United Kingdom to study sports management. Zaria Williams will be attending North Carolina A&T. And now for our college graduates. Aaliyah Babel graduated from Norfolk State University with a bachelor's degree in computer science and will be attending UNC Charlotte next year for her master's. Darius Hampton graduated from UNC Charlotte with a bachelor's degree in psychology. Darius will be going back to school next year for his master's in counseling at UNC Charlotte. And once again, congratulations to the class of 2020. At this time, I'd love to give a round of applause to all our graduates. Job chapter five, verses 15 and 16. He saves the needy from the sword in their mouth. He saves them from the clutches of the powerful so that the poor have hope and injustice shuts its mouth. In Proverbs 31, verse eight and nine, the words of God says, Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. En Proverbios 31, versículo 8 y 9, la palabra de Dios dice, Levanta la voz por los que no tienen voz. Defiende a los indefensos. Levanta la voz y hazle justicia. Defiende a los pobres y a los humildes. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 17. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. But let justice roll on like a river. Righteousness 
like a never failing stream. Galatians 6 2 reads, Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. It seems to me that God is intent on standing up for those who are poor, the oppressed, the widows, the orphans, the overlooked, and so many more. Since this is so, our lives must mirror the same. Wouldn't you agree?
Well, hello there, church. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, I'm Kevin Sampson. Uh, today for communion, we are going to be looking at Philippians 2, 1 through 13. It reads, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one of mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Let's pray, guys. Father, uh, thank you so much for just the time to be able to commune, to be able to uh, think about Jesus and Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Jesus, by definition, was lynched and uh, did it so that we could have this opportunity to be one with you. God, I think it's amazing that you did not consider equality uh, with yourself and the divine nature, something that was worth being obtained. So many times in the movies and in songs, we, we talk about giving it all up for someone we love. And here you showed and demonstrated that on the cross. Father, uh, there's a lot going on in the world. You've definitely slowed the world down uh, and exposed a lot of things uh, within our society as human beings. And God, uh, for those of us that don't really understand what's going on, that want to question, I pray that we can hold tighter to you. Uh, for those that feel um, hurt right now, God, I pray that we can hold on to you. Uh, but as a body, I pray that we can have unity. I pray that we can come together, that we can care for one another, as your scripture said, uh, that we look to the interest of others because in doing so, we're gonna also take care of ourselves. God, help us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. I think so many times uh, in our society, in our culture, we wanna fight for our rights. Um, we wanna stand up and I think that that does have its place. But God, I pray that we do have a healthy fear of you and really uh, applying the scriptures as you've given them to us because I think that's the way that we really will see true change. Thank you again for Jesus. Thank you for his sacrifice. Thank you for your love. It's in his name we pray, amen.
Treat love like a Chinese tattoo They'll wear it on their sleeve but don't know what it means I blame Romeo for shaping the culture It ain't just romance, you can't learn love from BET I recommend 1 Corinthians 13 Go down the list, you know love is the first thing Work it like a muscle, you'll see that thing increase Save yourself the drama, homie, trust me, that'll give you some peace Surrounded by chaos and the feeling of pending doom My ear is filled with murder and war that's on the news The battle of anxiety's happening in my head Cause the red and blue in my rear I'm just hoping this ain't my end, Lord Grant me the will to be tranquil as your son The same peace when Judas point him out and say he the one The understanding I probably never will understand But the knowledge that help me know that I am safe in his hands, Lord in our bones surrounded by glass but we feel it in our stones yeah we still get distracted while we look into our phones but if we look up we'll see god and we're at home and that there is the truth that i hold on to and claim because i saw tyler in his youth now see the man he became and i will never stand for my god to be defamed so yes i feel the joy that's why i'm singing out his name All right. I tell you what, I, I love that last song. Um, I t <laughs> had a nice little beat to it. It had me going for a minute, <laughs> right? Um, but that was great having those, that next generation. Actually, that's, that's who it was. That's from the Chicago Church of Christ and their next generation. They had a big service for next generation. And uh, those uh, young adults put, put that together. So that was pretty, pretty great. So, uh, Jesus culture, the mission. Theologians and biblical scholars call God's mission, Missio Dei, meaning the mission of God. And it's also from the Latin word meaning sending. And I want to look at God's heart as we talk about the mission that we all have and the mission that Jesus had. Turn your Bibles to Ezekiel 33. We'll start reading in verse 10, God speaking to Ezekiel says, And you, son of man, say to the house of Israel, This you have said, Surely our transgressions and our sins are upon us, and we rot away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, As I live, declares the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. For why will you die, O house of Israel? And so we see here, God is saying, I, I take no pleasure in the wicked. I just want the wicked to repent. Turn back, turn back. There's no need for you to die. Well, in John 3, 16, the Bible tells us that God so loved the world that he sent Jesus and he sent Jesus because he didn't want anyone to perish, but to have eternal life. We know in 2 Peter chapter 3 that the, Peter tells us that God is not slow as some have come to understand slowness, but God wants to give, he's giving people time. He is showering us with grace, 
the world with grace so that everybody can come to repentance. First Timothy chapter two, turn there. First Timothy chapter two. And let's look starting in verse one. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. This is God's heart. This is his heart. In Luke 19, 10, this is Jesus' mission statement. It says, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. That's his mission statement. Like a shepherd who seeks out his lost sheep. Like a woman who lost a coin and sweeps her house clean so, she, so that she can find this lost coin. Or like a father whose son has rejected him. And his father watches day and night watching for his son to return home. All of that in Luke chapter 15. And Jesus says, what is the kingdom of God like? And he lays out those three stories. And this mission, this mission of seeking and saving the lost, we know as disciples of Christ has been passed on to all disciples. In Matthew 28, Jesus says, as the disciples come to him, the 11 come to him. And it says they, I mean, they were like out of their minds a little bit. And they said they came to him and they worshiped, but some doubted. I mean, this was blow away what has happened in the last three years of their lives. And Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. And he just gives them, this is your mission. But he tells them, I'm with you always to the very end of the age. But go, all nations, all the world, all over, and make disciples. That mission, again, has been passed on to us but as we look at the church universal, growth, as we know and have heard, is slowing down. And I think the mission has all been, has all but been forgotten, put aside, remembered, but not lived out by many. And yet we are men and women with a mission. And when you live with a mission, when you're a person that you are driven by something, a mission, a focus, a compass. That mission shapes your focus. It shapes all of your relationships. It shapes your perspective. You can look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. Paul says, since we know what it is to fear the Lord, we try and persuade men. It's a mission. When you live with a mission, it shapes how you live, it shapes your decisions, and it shapes your identity. Many of you have seen the movie 1917. It's the story of two young British soldiers during World War I, and they were given orders and given a specific mission. Maybe many of you have seen the movie 1917. And it's the story of two British soldiers during World War I who were given a mission. And the mission was to deliver a message to call off a planned attack by British soldiers on the German army because this attack uh, was doomed to fail because what was originally thought to be a German retreat was actually a strategic withdrawal to a new location because the Germans had in mind to overwhelm the British army with artillery fire. And so they were just waiting and that was discovered. And the British trenches though, where uh, 
these soldiers were, the field uh, telephone lines had been cut, so they had to do it the old-fashioned way. Hence, the two soldiers having to physically go and deliver this message. And if they failed in this mission, they were told, that it could mean the lives of 1,600 men, including the brother of one of the soldiers who, one of the two soldiers called to go on this mission. If they failed, failure meant certain death. So you follow these two soldiers on this mission. And when you're fulfilling a mission, you have it, you start, and as you're fulfilling this mission, there are things that you will encounter along the way. But in order to fulfill that mission, you must have a compass that drives your conviction. A compass that drives your conviction. In other words, for these soldiers, their compass was we have to save the lives of these 1600 men. We cannot let them go into an ambush. And if we don't deliver this message to the colonel in time, 1600 men will lose their lives. And so whatever we have to go through, we have to get this message to the colonel on time so that this attack that they're going to uh, do, they'll stop it. And so the things that you'll encounter on a mission, distractions, opposition, fatigue, this mission that we have to seek and to save the lost. We know we're opposed. We, we, we face opposition, distractions, fatigue. It gets tiring as you're pouring yourself out into other people and for the benefit of other people. Hardships along the way. Fears and doubts you will face when you're fulfilling your mission. A potential loss of perspective because we focus on many times how far we have to go and we don't consider and maybe turn back a little bit just to see how far we've actually come. And so we potentially could lose perspective. We encounter death on our mission. In other words, people leave the Lord. They spiritually die. And our prayer and hope is that there will be repentance and they come back to God through Jesus. These soldiers encountered death along the way. In fact, spoiler alert, one of the soldiers, in fact, was killed. And the soldier who was with him as he was holding him, and comforting him while he was dying, he says to uh, Officer Blake, or the soldier named Blake, he says, I will complete this mission, and I'll see your brother, and I'll tell him how heroic you were, and I'll also write a letter back to your mother so that she will know how heroic you were during this time. And of course, he goes and he completes the mission, and so we'll have encounters with death, and that affects us in a great way, especially with those that we have poured ourselves into and love. But also there's something, uh, we were talking about this in the staff meeting, and Jasmine brought up this term, shadow missions. And I didn't know anything about it, and it was new to me, so I just looked it up. And shadow missions are something that looks and feels like your real mission, but it's actually an imposter. And someone has said that a shadow mission is the good that can become the enemy of the best. The good that can become the enemy of the best. In his book, Overcoming Your Shadow Mission, author John Ortberg says, a shadow mission is an actual mission that has been derailed, often in imperceptible ways. Part of what makes the shadow mission so tempting is that it's actually so closely related to our gifts and passions. It's not 180 degrees off track. It is just 10 degrees off track. So it's just slightly off track. And if we follow those shadow missions, and we're going, let's say it's true, it's just 10 degrees. We're still off of our main mission. 
and we miss the mark and we miss achieving what God has really called us to. Holly Girth, who is a, a coach and a blogger, has on her site ways that you can tell if you're slipping into your shadow mission. And I want to share some of those with you. Number one, she says about a shadow mission. A shadow mission exhausts you while a true mission energizes you. Now, you think, well, making disciples exhaust you, and that's true, right? Again, pouring yourself out. But it's just like when families experience the birth of new babies. Even though baby Oliver is having a hard time and our hearts go out with him, there is joy there. And there's a lot of hope and prayers that all of us are giving that baby Oliver continues to grow stronger and stronger. Samuel and Nadege are feeling a great joy right now with their new baby boy. And there's a couple of other uh, expectant uh, brothers and sisters right now. And this is, this is great. Think of the joy that Jamal and Delise and their family feels at the new birth of Victoria. There's a joy that comes. Even though you're exhausted, there's a joy and energy that comes in making disciples. Number two, a shadow mission is about you, but a true mission involves you, but it also includes God and others. Number three, a shadow mission can lead to resentment, while a true mission lets you serve no matter what the response is. And lastly, a shadow mission makes you feel more distant from God, even though you're trying to earn his approval while a true mission brings you closer to the Lord. And see, our mission, our mission is not world peace. Our mission is not racial or social equality. Our mission in Christ is not even ending world hunger or ending poverty. Our mission is not a great number of those other noble endeavors that need some of our attention as disciples of Jesus Christ. Our mission is to seek and save that which is lost. And so the quality of our discipleship really does matter. It really does matter. Now, there may be some of you or some who are listening today that think that I'm getting off message in light of what's happening in this present racial crisis in our country. But I want to share some things with you why that is not true. I'm not off message. I'm actually more on message than most. And here's why. The more that we preach and live the gospel, the more lives are changed. And see, we bring people to Jesus and teach them wherever they may be lacking. They make a decision for Jesus and they ask, brother, sister, what should I do? And then you tell them, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins so that you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And now. A baptized disciple equipped with the Holy Spirit, they begin to make different and better decisions in life. The former thief will say no to that ungodly life and instead give to those in need whatever the need. The former bully will say no to that ungodly life and instead be a comforter to any downtrodden soul. The racist will say no to that ungodly life and instead train himself to see people through the eyes of Christ. The hater will say no to that ungodly life and instead will train him or herself in that all the other virtues that they want to grow in, they will put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. The elitist will say no to that ungodly life and instead will strive to be like Jesus 
who being in the very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. And so I'm not off center. I'm not off message. I'm right on the mission. And while the world is going crazy, the world is angry, enraged, livid, fighting and biting one another. Yes, people are raising up. People are being uh, uh, supportive of one another in a new and different way. Our calling as disciples is to take those souls to Jesus so that they can make a decision for Jesus and work along with a great throng of unknown other men and women. So that people will say and mean and live that Jesus is Lord. So in conclusion, don't get off track by shadow missions. But remember the mission that Jesus has passed on to all of us. Always move forward in your mission with Jesus Christ. And along the way, advocate for people who cannot advocate for themselves. Listen and learn empathize and have compassion with people be the salt and the light in this lost world because the darker the world gets the brighter the church must shine in closing here's a song by some more chicago youth it's a song called who you say i am and i want to encourage you to listen to the whole song and watch the whole song and be encouraged and be inspired. Amen. In my
Thank you are for me.